and to introduce to introduce this important and timely conversation on plant intelligence with Paco Calvo and Natalie Lawrence. My name is Giovanni Aloy. I am a Plant Initiative Board member. I've authored many books on the representation of animals, plants, and the environment in art. And I also curate exhibitions on these subjects. I teach art history and visual culture at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and I'm the editor of Antenna, the Journal of Nature and Visual Culture, as well as the co-editor of Art After Nature, a series of books published by the University of Minnesota Press. This program is sponsored by the Plant Initiative, a nonprofit organization that works to encourage respectful treatment of plants and to support development of an effective movement towards this goal. Today, I have the great pleasure to introduce this event in collaboration with Plant Initiative board member, Laura Pustarfi and Paul Moss, the co-founder and executive director of the Plant Initiative. I'm gonna introduce them to you briefly. Laura Pustarfi is a plant studies scholar with a focus on trees and is adjunct faculty in philosophy and religion at the California Institute of Integral Studies. She's also the associate director of the Psychedelic Assisted Therapies and Research Certificate Program at CIIS. Paul Moss has a degree in biology, agronomy, and marketing, and has most recently been studying in the Department of Geography, Environment, and Society at the University of Minnesota. He has served as the executive director of Cottonwood Foundation since 1992. It is now a great pleasure that I can introduce today's speakers. Paolo Calvo is professor of philosophy of science and principal investigator of the Minimal Intelligence Laboratory at the University of Murcia in Spain. He does research in the philosophy of plant neurobiology, ecological psychology, and embodied cognitive science. Professor Calvo studies the ecological basis of plant intelligence by conducting experimental studies at the intersection of the areas of plant neurobiology and ecological psychology. And it's also a great pleasure to have with us Natalie Lawrence, an author and illustrator who explores our relationship with the natural world, looking through multiple lenses from the biological to the psychoanalytic. She has two master's degrees, including natural sciences, as well as a PhD in history and philosophy of science from the University of Cambridge. She currently lives in London, teaches biology, and writes in a room filled with plants and specimens <laughs> from her natural history collection. Some information about the structure of the program. It will last an hour, with the first half being a conversation between Laura, Paco, and Natalie. Attendees are welcome to place questions in the chat, which is being monitored by Paul. There are many attendees today with us, over 700 registered attendees. So uh, please bear in mind when you um, write your questions, keep them brief and sharp. As you all know, plant intelligence is a hotly debated and extremely timely subject. Paco Calvo and Natalie Lawrence's book, Plant a Sapiens, a Masking Plant Intelligence, is already causing ripples across the sciences and the humanities. Understanding plant intelligence requires effort. It demands, us a, sub it demands a sub substantial conceptual and phenomenological shift. It is a challenge that I feel we must embrace in order to envision new registers of empathy with more than human worlds and to build truly sustainable futures. While many of us are deeply fascinated by plant intelligence, others feel undoubtedly threatened by its destabilizing agency. Rethinking the role plants play in our world is likely to lead to uncomfortable and yet necessary hierarchical revisions. Giving plant intelligence the serious consideration it deserves entails a radical reconsideration of our ethical and moral registers. It demands us to rethink our practices as well as reconsidering our objectives in life as individuals and communities. Plant intelligence is revolutionary. We cannot miss this valuable chance to change our worlds, starting from plants, and to relearn how to see them again anew from challenging perspectives. I'm sure that you are now ready for this 
eagerly awaited conversation. Paco and Natalie, it's a great pleasure to have you here. And Laura, please take it away. Thank you so much, Giovanni. And thank you everyone for joining us today. And especially, thank you so much, Paco. Thank you so much, Natalie, for being here. Hello. <laughs> I'm joining you today from the North Bay near San Francisco, California, which is occupied indigenous Southern Pomo and Coast Miwok territory, collectively represented by Federated Indians of Great and Rancheria. So Paco and Natalie, we're here to speak about your book, Planta Sapiens. And Giovanni, thank you for the contextualization. You've just explored plant intelligence so extensively while looking at the implications of vegetal intelligence. So I'm really excited to talk to you both today. Welcome. And the repulse, right? Yeah. So Giovanni mentioned repulse. <laughs> oh, we need to do something about that repulse. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. And we'll get there. We'll yeah, get there. So yeah, to, yeah. to start out, I'm curious to learn a little bit more about each of you. Could you tell us about your memories of plants from growing up? Why don't you start, Paco? Do I? Uh, actually, well, um, I guess I don't have anything, you know, especially relevant to say other than, yeah, sure, I was surrounded by plants or by whatever I was surrounded, which means I, if you tell me what are my first memories, I guess because I grew up in the southeast of Spain, I can think of cacti and that sort of things, but uh, things, eh? did you see uh, how difficult it is to get out of the conceptual traps and um, that sort of agents cacti and others but that's just a contingency i mean i mean I, I, if i had grown up in canada or anywhere else i would be speaking of other plants so i don't think it's the specific or the specific species or plants that i might have encountered when i was a kid or something but just the fact that you were able to you know to open your eyes and, and see what was out there and try to engage or interact with them in, in, in a different way. Of course, I would be lying to yourself and to myself if, if I you know, meant to say that at that time I was somehow aware of the fact that they were agents or that I was missing something. Of course, any of that, right? That came way later. Hmm. I think for me when I was younger, um, I, places, places that were very important to me were always dominated by plants. So I always used to go, there's a Place called Hampstead Heath near me, which is one of the sort of wilder parks in London. It was it's filled with lots of old trees, um, lots of oaks and beeches, and I used to spend half my time there, and that was that was really important to me. But I also have to admit that I was probably more interested in the animals in the trees at the time. <laughs> um, I never really expected to come to this understanding of, of plants and to to work mm -hmm. with Paco writing a book on them. Um, so I, while I appreciated the spaces that plants created, I didn't really have any of this kind of perspective when I was that age. It is work in progress, actually, as of 2023. 20, I mean, to myself, when you say, hey, when, what were you doing? What was happening when you were a kid or whatever? So now it's work in progress as of today for ourselves. So it's, it's, it's so difficult. I mean, definitely it's, it's yeah. yeah. That leads somewhat into my, my next question. When did you first realize that plants are intelligent? Was there a particular moment for mm. each of you, or was it an insight that emerged over time? Mm. Well, actually, well, in, in, in the idea of being work in progress applies to the to this very question, right? So it's not like, oh, I did realize at some point, oh, they've got to be intelligent, or oh, I, I see it, or I no, no, it's more a theoretical approach. It's like a shifting, like a frame of mind. Mm -hmm. It's like not the answer, but the question is like, hey. Mm, what is it that I'm missing? Am I missing something special? Is it like, what's going wrong? I mean, why are we so obsessed with, you know, with the animal way of behaving? Or, and I, I couldn't think there was a tipping point uh, at any time. If I think of my intellectual biography, like I said, okay, this is it. It's something really uh, subtle. Um, if if there is a point in time, I mean, maybe this is something, it's not really spoiler. I think we speak about this in, in the very first chapters. But yeah, actually, uh, um, about the, the, the book that I, I did get to, to review um, on um, plant communication, neuronal aspects of plant life by, at that time, I didn't know them, uh, Frantisque Baluska um, and two other co-editors. And, and you'll find them in the acknowledgements of the book. And at that time, I, I, I was like, oh, gosh, this is it. 
I mean, this is what I was missing, right? So, so in retrospective, yes, there is what there was a tipping point, right? And I did get to to to, to read this book, and I just couldn't help it. I just had to, you know, catch a plane and get to meet them, and we, you know, sat and at this conference, and and that's where everything got started. Now, what does it mean things getting started? It means. Oh, uh, everything is, you know, is 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 work in progress again, and and we need to rethink, you know, root and branch everything. But because I was coming from from human and animal uh, cognitive sciences or the study of, of animal and, and and the human or the animal mind more generally, I I was thinking, oh, we, here we are we are kind of, you know, uh, this is two birds with one stone. I mean, we are doing something or we need to do something about or throw in light in a different way, both about how we encounter, how we approximate, how we approach the study of the human or the animal mind. And now, especially now that we do understand at last that at least there is something to be done if we want to truly understand what it means for a plant, you know, what is it like to be a plant as if you want to go to one of the, the chapter titles as well, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Mm. I'd say it's probably meeting Paco that um, really triggered people <laughs> for me. Um, but I think um, some of the issues that we talk about are kind of nascent, the kind of nascent ideas are emergent from evolutionary understanding, the idea that organisms live in incredibly complex environments that cannot be dealt with except mm. by some kind of intelligence, some kind of sentient experience that um, allows them to integrate all these different types of information and, and come up with nuanced responses. Mm. It cannot just be um, sort of knee-jerk, simple yeah. responses. It actually so, keeps growing and growing, right? Because you spread it all the way from plants, fungi, bacteria, so it just... So it made made sense. And it, it wasn't a shock to me. It sort of, it, it fitted with what I knew already, um, which isn't, I think, as other people have found slightly more challenging <laughs> from some of the responses we've had. Hmm. I think that's one of the wonderful things about this book is that it might inspire some some sort of similar impulse in other people as well to think about plants a little differently. So I really appreciate hmm. that. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of this term intelligence, hmm. can you tell us more about how you define intelligence and why you <laughs> use that term in particular over other more commonly used words for plants like adaptive yeah. or responsive or other words? The million dollar question, right? <laughs> actually, actually, look, I mean, uh, I have have to remove a few things from my desk, but look, okay, you see this? You see this, right? Now, this is, I have it open because I was, I'll tell you what I was doing. Okay, you see this? Okay. So I, I, I was rereading Harari's Sapiens uh, because of this abstract I have to prepare for this conference. And I just went through it and and, and I thought, um, we still don't get it. I mean, we do mean to say the same very thing, right? Sapiens, Hararis sapiens, um, planta sapiens, we do mean it in the very same way. And that's what I find so difficult to convey to, to you know, to some audiences, uh, maybe not here, but in some other places. It's a hard pill to swallow to many people, right? And and if you think about it, I don't, I don't like to give set in stone definitions, but if you go to sapiens across the tree of life, again, not just plants, right? But uh, uh, a working definition or something that does make sense to me is, is well, let, let's take it step by step, you know, one thing at a time. Okay, let's try to understand what adaptive behavior is about, right? Um, and then let's not put too much cart before a horse when we think about human adaptive behavior, because we tend to get overexcited with the type of things we are able to do. And then if it's something that the bacteria or a plant or a fungi does, then we downgrade it, right? So if you think, okay, if this is just adaptive behavior, so be it, but for all of us, right? Then, um, then you say, okay, what else do we need on top of it? Oh, of course, adaptive behavior might just be good, but on you know an evolutionary time scale, then of course it's got to be flexible enough. Again, flexible enough not for humans, for any organism that is our you know topic of research. So any model organism, whatever. So it's got to be flexible. It's got to be anticipatory. It's got to be goal-directed behavior. Now, 
some people com even complain, you know, about these ripples uh, Giovanni was mentioning. Some people even complain if I say, hey, let's, let's look at, you know, the type of plan behavior that on top of being adaptive is truly flexible, is anticipatory, is goal-directed, and let's see what we can do about it. Let's see how we can, you know, rethink how we appreciate those behavioral patterns. And then people complain and say, hey, hey, hold on, I said, they are, you know, they are non-neural based or non-animal based or not. they are, they are doing their own thing. They are called adaptations. Easy. Apply those very same labels to some pattern of, you know, animal behavior, human or non-human. And you will find out that you don't have such a built-in default resistance towards putting them under this light of, oh yeah, this is intelligence. This is intelligent behavior, right? So my suggestion is to keep it neutral at all levels and say, hey, why don't we just observe behavior? So behavior, overt behavior of organisms, any organism whatsoever, why don't you, we just observe their behavior? And then we can discuss how sophisticated that behavior is and whether it deserves to be called intelligent behavior or not. But that cannot be something to be discussed on the grounds that it belongs to one kingdom in the tree of life or to another kingdom. It has to do with how sophisticated that pattern of behavior is, regardless of the kingdom itself, right? Hmm. Yeah, I think there's a bit of risk in leading with terms like looking for intelligence because it, it you, you, as Paco says, you automatically bias yourselves in certain directions depending on what you're looking at. Um, I can't really add to his definition, of course, but um, the... But they're all working definitions. I mean, we don't yeah. need to set anyone in a stone. No. Just, I mean, you know, we can keep revising them, right? Yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Um, you can keep revising it and revising it and revising it. But you so could what... certainly distinguish between um, behaviours that are just pure adaptations that don't require any kind of high level processing or have greater complexity to them that are stereotyped responses to the same stimulus. And so we are sort of talking about behavior that is driven by more complex mechanisms than that, that are that are much more much more flexible and yeah. um, not going to be the yeah. same in every case in the same to the same stimulus. Yeah. Now, some readers, if either if they've already read the book or if they read it now, if they go to part two to the uh, middle section of the book, they will find that that we have a way to say, hey, hold on a sec. Um, you know, maybe we are overinterpreting some of our behaviors and, and maybe studying plants is going to help us rethink what we mean by human intelligence or human cognition. Because some of those things that we think that require higher level processing, oh, a neocortex, mammals, we have neocortex, wow. Say, so hold on a sec. We might be doing things in other ways despite having a neocortex. Let's talk about hormones. Let's talk about subcortical processes. So even in the case that we are able to identify some region, some substrate that, oh, this is, you know, it's, not, it's never the silver bullet. So we might be, that's what I meant about the, the two birds with one stone, right? We may be able to, to, to learn more of, about ourselves. Because maintaining behavioral of... flexibility and mm. intelligent behaviors is costly on an evolutionary scale. So it's, it, or there's always going to be a tendency to draw towards stereotyping behaviors if they are the right if they are the right thing to do in mm. every every situation of that kind so we probably overestimate how much of our behavior mm. is actually driven from um, complex underlying mechanisms actually um, mm. and I, I think this term in particular is is really helpful to show as you were saying some of the parallels in, in capacity and um, responsiveness between humans and, and other organisms especially plants so I'm curious, as a maybe as a teaser for some of those who haven't read the book, if you could just share an example of how plants are intelligent. There are so many, but maybe hmm. there's one that comes to mind for each of you. Um, yeah. Well, actually, uh, yeah. So usually people, you know, when someone sometimes some people ask, "Hey, what's your favorite plant?" Right. Um, I I tend to um, to not have a clear cut answer because, for one thing. This is a risky thing to do because we end up not realizing that we are treating them all as if they were just, you know, all into the same basket. Like, oh, they are plants. They are individuals of the plant kingdom. They've got to be doing the same somehow. They are all in the business of doing what? And then again, going to the middle part of the book, 
people will see that that uh, many times, you know, understanding what plants are doing has more to do with understanding the surroundings. What is it that they are doing with respect to the surroundings? How we, are they are interacting with those surroundings? So I'm talking more about the surroundings than about the inner part of the plant itself, the body, the plant body itself. And that means that we need to, you know, to keep an eye on both. And when you do that, that means that thinking of the plant as the individual where I'm going to study intelligence makes no sense. Because intelligence, on top of the previous definition we were discussing, has to do with the environment and organism as a system as such. Mm. So, so pick any plant whatsoever that you might think, uh, intuitively speaking, that is, oh, it's got to be real smart. Look at this plant. It makes no sense to speak of the smartness of the plant as such. Smartness or the intelligence belongs to the system itself. It's not a plant in void space. It's a plant interacting in a particular context. So that's some of the examples we use in the book precisely have to do with the distinction in between, hey, vines, for example, is a dear example to me, right? We speak a lot of, about vines in the book, but which vines? Domesticated vines, the ones growing in the wild, what sort of wilderness? What sort of domesticated environment? Is it, we were speaking before the conversation, right? Uh, about the, the potted ones in, in our rooms, the ones out there in the orchard, who other guys are around? How are they, are they interacting with them? So we end up realizing that this is a matter of collective intelligence, that intelligence cannot be discussed as it if belong to the individual. It's collective intelligence, ecologically uh, meaningful interactions related to the whole population or you know, the type of interactions in between individuals. Now, if people read the book, they will find, oh, yeah, okay, but yeah, sure, but he doesn't want to mention, but but he spend, spends the whole book talking about vines, right? We speak a lot about vines. Yes, but again, this, uh, this is a risky issue if we just think, oh, vines have got to be especially smart because we see them doing all the stuff they do. They are, you know, effortfully trying to grab a pole or the stuff we describe in the book. Um, and it's true that they do these things. It's true that we can study those, those patterns of behavior, how effortfully they are trying to, to you know, to, to do their, their daily business. Uh, but by the same token, the risky part comes with forgetting that we might be falling prey of this anthropomorphizing risk that we speak in the book about. Because we might say, hey, why are you appreciating that type of intelligent plant behavior so much? Because it resembles what an animal might do. And then you have to think, maybe a plant that is truly smart doesn't need to be showing it off to you as an animal observer. Because we appreciate it because they look to be, oh, they are, you know, like we speak of the fly fishing line or the cowboy lassoing or something. And that's a good metaphor. But maybe there is this plant sitting somewhere doing less sexy or less appealing things and might be way more intelligent or maybe more smart. Or doing it on the Right, sure. Or below ground. Right? So yeah, yeah, um, definitely. Um, hmm. I think that's one of my favorite examples we use in the book is, is um, what, what Paco has, has talked about with the differences between wild and domesticated vines and the, the fact that you've got these kind of pampered domestic um, strains that have not really had to fight for survival and they can, can't really do anything unless everything is given to them on a silver platter. And then the, the wild ones that are much more canny and much more capable of um, mm. sort of fighting in in the wilds for things um and Paco had to go to madagascar to go and try and fi find some um find mm. some of these wild ones which again is something that happens with animals right so when you, you you do animal studies in the lab you've got to say hey how does this extrapolate how can we you know is the leap in between this and real you know ecological settings so that's not a topic that belongs to it's not the plant issue it's an issue of how we you know get to study any behavior yeah. yeah, and maybe just to, to dig into this example just a little bit more in, in terms of the vines that you're talking about. The I know we're not able to show the video right now, but the video is really um, impressive in, in terms of the, the plant mutating and then uh, and then actually kind of, as you were saying, lassoing for the pole. And um, it, it really seems like a, a gentle or decision oriented mm -hmm. Uh, move. So I'm curious if you could talk just a little bit more about that specific. Example. He's yeah. going to tell you you can't, you can't, <laughs> you can't read too much into it now. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, no. That, that, that's good that you mentioned because because now there is there, I, I've got to flag some a warning message. Okay, like like to chill out. We've got to take it easy <laughs> because. One of, if you remember the preface in the book, one of the risks, I'm really concerned about the risks. You've seen, I've, I've mentioned risk, risk, risk a lot of times. And I'm really concerned about the skeptical attitude, but also about people who are too eager to, to buy the message, not critically. So we need to find some middle ground to have solid data to, good, to do robust science. Now, uh, uh, this precisely gets to the heart of the question uh, when I was mentioning, hey, some plants might be doing way less exciting things to the human eye, either through time-lapse photography or to the naked eye. Um, we might be, we should, we might need to be equally moved. Um, uh, that's why on top of uh, time-lapsing plant behavior, we are also trying to record electrophysiological activity uh, uh, within the plant body. Because, and that's a really important thing, because again, if you go to animal studies, that's what you do. So you are able to observe animal behavior and then you can you know, check the neural correlates of some you know, uh, trait. Um, and, and then we can have a story you know, in the making as to, as to you know, how, what does that means as to the type of, you know, cognitive machinery that we are positing in the animal case, right? So going back to the vine that we are time lapsing, you might be looking at this vine that is revolving around, revolving around, and you might be, oh, what a boring vine. It's not doing anything. Come on, do something, right? Because we just want the vine to do something for us. And the vine doesn't care about us. The vine cares about the pole, not about you watching it, right? So maybe, Think of this example. Maybe the vine is growing because it's revolving and growing, right? That's how it's reaching the target. Because eventually, of course, it doesn't walk out. Right? So it just, it's got to grow to reach it. It's a potted plant or just uh, whatever. So if it's got to grow while it's revolving in circles to get to the point, it might just not even need to show anything spectacular in terms of the overt behavior you're able to appreciate because eventually, by mere growth, I might just get there. So what to you might look like boring behavior from the plant's perspective might be real smart. So it's not about action. It, sometimes it might be inaction. So, so um, excitatory and inhibitory behaviors are you know, two sides of the same coin. And we might be, you know, uh, too biased to appreciating one type of behavior and too biased to missing the others, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why combining the observation of the overt behavior through time lapse with electrophysiological recordings allows us to have a richer picture of what's going on. Mm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a problem we, we do talk about a lot in the book is that we have to be keenly aware of the limitations and predispositions of our own sensory systems when we're and our own understandings of things when we're looking at this. It's really hard to get at from a human perspective and it's a very particular perspective. Um, and trying to get outside of that takes a lot of imaginative work and a lot of scientific work and it's quite difficult to know quite how to go about it properly. Mm. Mm. Um, like, for example, there's it does link to another problem. I, a lot of people put this down um or they, they will mention you know historical attitudes of of plant symbolism and valuing nature in a different way and we've lost that with our scientific attitude etc but actually a lot of kind of animistic world views aren't really understanding plants in their own terms they are projecting human values onto them they're not we, we have never really uh, or at least mm. in Western culture have never really understood plants on their own terms. We've they've had value within human systems and they've had they've been ascribed values by us. Um, so this this work hasn't has, has a lot long way to go. Um, we can't just hark back to a kind of golden age when we were in touch with nature. Um, it's a it's a it's a different thing we're aiming for here. Hmm. Natalie mentioned one thing which is really interesting: uh, um, the role of imagination. Right, because again, the skeptical attitude many times, you know, this uh, repulse has to do with, hey, you know, this is a, a leap, or you are just, you know, wishful thinking, or what, as if imagination was not 
part and parcel of the scientific method. So there is no science, there is no good science without in the uh, boost of imagination. Imagination is part and parcel of following the scientific method. So there is a cartoon version of science, which is like, okay, once everything is set, right? Okay, okay, you can just click something and automated or not, the hypothesis get tested and results can be output. And then we write the paper. Now, not even that, chat GPT writes the paper and then you publish it. That's the cartoon version of where science is going. And we are missing what science is about if we don't give imagination the role, the epistemic role it deserves. That's something we encourage also to do in the book, uh, to understand imagination in the positive, um, the positive role, the constructive role it, it, it has to play. Hmm. Um, thank you. I, I wonder if that's almost the answer to my next question, but I'm <laughs> your your um, more extended version. What what is necessary to study plants on their own terms? Hmm. Well, one thing uh, going back to uh, Natalie's previous comment is, in a sense, one thing which is truly necessary is to forget about ourselves. Hmm. Um, <laughs> no, it's it's true. I mean, think of the issue of the. Um, Special temporal scales. Um, this has to do with the temporal scale in which behavior unfolds, the temporal scale in which I make the observations that I do make, the spatial scale in which plants interact with the surroundings, the spatial scale of the space I occupy as I'm observing plants, um, and the lack of convergence in between our respective spatial temporal sp scales, right? Um, when those scales converge, we feel uh, relieved. Um, and we shouldn't, because that's a byproduct. So we might be flagging something which is simply a happy cosmic fluke of the fact that those scales are converging now, right? So, so one thing which is, I understand this is a difficult exercise to do, but um, Oof, it's it's really difficult, but but um, I keep thinking about that a lot. About how can we forget about ourselves when we are observing plants, right? Um, that's one part of the equation. Uh, uh, the other part, yes, in a sense, it was responded in the a couple of questions ago about the combination of of of, for example, doing time lapse and electrophysiological recordings. Now, again, many people complain that oh. Looks like you are obsessed with electrophysiological recordings. What's what's the fuss about you know mm, uh, neural-like activity? A square a square quotes because many people say plants have no neurons, plants have no brains, plants have no synapses. Say, sure, but when we speak of electrical activity being conveyed, being passed along the the whole plant body, we need to think of what's going on uh, in the in the body of any organism whatsoever both unicellular and multicellular. And it has to do with conveying messages, with the processing of information that goes beyond the need to meet physiological or metabolic needs. So that's one of the mistakes that many people are thinking, hey, we do the plant physiology, what else needs to be done? Look, if, if, if we did that, also for animals, human and non-human animals, so be it. It could be just a theoretical approach that can be justified, can be criticized, but is legitimate to approach it in those terms, the very issue of how you study behavior. Okay, it's a physiological-based approach, but across the board, but they don't apply it across the board. So, no, no, if it's a form of life that I tend to downgrade by default, we just do the physiology and we are done. If it's us, how beautiful we are, oh, physiology is not enough. We need to be doing the psychology, right? So there is a lot of theoretical work that also relates to this idea of the role that the imagination plays. And that's precisely one of the reasons that, again, some people miss. Some people say, mm, you are doing all this being based in a philosophy department? And um, again, that's again something that we discuss in the book. Um, and there is a reason for that. It has to do with the type of questions that we are raising that don't get raised 
in a plant biology unit, in a psychology department. And so in the philosophy and the cognitive sciences, we are able comparative psychology, comparative psychology and philosophy of biology and philosophy of cognitive science, we are raising questions that no one else was raising before. People who were raising them were again missing them as in, hey, we are doing the ecology, we are doing the plant physiology. No, no, we still have to do the comparative psychology, but without apology, without apology. We don't need to apologize for doing comparative psychology across kingdoms because this has to do with what we can learn by applying tools that belong to comparative psychology. And we are not signing any blank check by doing so, because people think, oh, you are committed to, no, I'm not committed to showing this or showing that. I'm committed, scientifically speaking, to exploring. And exploration means that some working hypotheses will get refuted, other ones will get confirmed, the ones that got confirmed eventually might got disconfirmed, refuted. That's the way science works. But I insist across the board. We cannot say, oh, okay, let's do one type of science for one type of subjects and another type of science for another type of subjects. Let's, let's do science. Um, let's not try to push one way or another. That's to me the only recipe. Because that way, that's what I mean by having solid data a, 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 a robust theoretical framework, a robust theoretical background, right? Hmm. Hmm. Did you want to say, jump in? I don't think I have anything to add to that at this moment. Um, um, yeah. Well, I, I'd like to go in a, a different direction. And I know we have questions from the audience coming up soon. And um, I want to ask about the, the ethical issue. So you mentioned a little bit in the book about the, the implications of plant intelligence and ethical concerns. And I, I'm curious if you could share a bit about uh, that with us now, and then what plants' rights might look like in relation to human rights. Will humans need to start treating plants differently? Hmm. Oh, as we were discussing before the, the, um, the, this talk, we, um, we haven't really sorted that out even for other mammals or other humans have we very well <laughs> that is ethical rights are to some degree mutable and they're sort of decided by society so um i think paco whenever he gives a talk on this yeah. he always gets uh, the first people to ask questions are the vegans want, worried about their um, where their source of sustenance is now going to be able to come from um i think you can um you can treat other organisms with consideration while still um you know, using them as a food source, etc. I think we will need to shift the way that we deal with the natural world in general, not only in terms of how we grow and eat plants and, and other animals, but just in everything, everything about our interactions with the natural world needs to change. Um, yeah. Clearly, <laughs> so we've got into quite yeah. a mess. Um, and I think this will be part, this will be an integral part of doing that, yeah. um, valuing ecosystems in a more holistic way, um, not just, you know, the flagship animals that live in them. Um, will be a very important shift. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, th there is there is something that worries me. Yeah, uh, uh, I'm on the same page as Natalie, um, but there is something that worries me that has to do with well, well first the, first a disclaimer. Uh, I'm not a plant ethicist, right? So I, I don't do ethics. So um, this is just an in, uninformed opinion I just share with you all, but. Um, um, but one thing that worries me is that we are not truly um, we are not being truly concerned about plant ethics, because if we were, we wouldn't be thinking of the justification of the rights that they should be getting as insofar as they connect to the our needs. So I would like to see a discussion of plant ethics. Let's, let's play this game, this uh, uh, thought experiment. Let's think human, uh, well, uh, the animal kingdom didn't exist, okay? This is a planet where, you know, a few, few years ago, a planet where still there are no animals or and in the future, if we go extinct, right? Um, um, I would like to see the discussion, conceptually speaking, the discussion of the rights of the plant kingdom 
in a world where they don't relate to us as in, hey, we need them. We would care for them in the same way if we couldn't say we need those resources, right? So I, I, yeah, as uh, Natalie mentioned, we were talking about this 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 issue before before the the public conversation went went online. And um, actually, we we have a with Miguel Segundo, a postdoc uh, researcher here at, at the Minimal Intelligence Lab, we have this target article in in, in the journal Animal Sentience. Uh, just came out last last month, and now there is all all these commentaries. Uh, um, um, they are responding to our target, and then we'll have to respond to the commentaries. Blah blah blah. So all this uh, academic game, and 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 one thing that worries me when I you know when I see the commentaries, is that I don't I I don't see I don't see that genuine concern for plants' life for their own sake. <clears throat> for their own sake that's what i meant about this game of pretending not to be here on planet earth because when you truly think about you know their 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 uh, uh well-being uh, for themselves in themselves and for themselves then then i don't think we are playing the same uh, the same game uh, theoretically speaking we are you know on on, on different ground um, and either we are something that still still shocks me. Either we say no, no, they couldn't be, you know, uh, given rights because they have not a brain, they have no neurons, they have no. I beg your pardon. So um, that was written where <laughs> you've got to have some type of a special substrate or structure in order to be eligible for some type of right. Or I thought it had to do with inflicting unnecessary damage or pain, which, you know, something that you could avoid. And why don't you avoid it if you can, right? But as I said, you know, I'm not an ethicist to, to provide uh, informed comments. It might be something we have to admit about our ethical systems in that they have in-group and out-group qualities. And in this case, we're using neurons and brains as the, as the deciding factor. Um, mm. it's, not, it's not unilateral altruism. It's a ethical consideration ethical sensibility is probably an evolved characteristic which has contingencies in within which it's applicable and it's kind mm. of quite hard to get away from that so it actually might show yeah. the limitations of our our ethical capacities mm. that we can't really countenance yeah. um, including organisms as different as plants mm. and and again something we mentioned in the book and uh, 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 um, is you know Probably the, the best way, the easiest way to see that we are not quite there yet is that we don't get rid of the term resource. So even the most you know, good hearted uh, uh, people trying to push you know, in this line, speak of resources. So if we don't see all that is wrong with the very label, it is a lot of work yet to be done they are not resources to be exploited more or less wisefully they are agents in themselves for themselves <laughs> period definitely definitely i completely agree with that mm. and and what you're both pointing to um so clearly is is the the human perspective especially from the the western understanding of plants and of course there are other understandings around the world from indigenous and other cultures that that offer other other perspectives as well and thinking about the western view from the 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 human-centered perspective and uh, there's so much more to be done on that ethical question so thanks for digging into it with me mm. here <laughs> well i think we'll, we'll shift over to some questions from the audience and um we've we've got a few already and um please if you have a question put it in the chat and we'll uh, send it to paul moss and we will Get to as many questions as we can. So oh, the time first... flies. Time flies. <laughs> Forty minutes already. <laughs> when you're having a good conversation, yes, it does. Yeah. So the, the first one also uh, dives into to a topic we were talking about a little bit before. It's, someone is asking, "What are your thoughts about intelligence and psychedelic plants?" Well, that's an interesting question. <laughs> so the degree to which we see ourselves as the actors and plants as, as these sort of passive objects was actually plants spend quite a lot of time manipulating us 
<laughs> well, they've done very well manipulating us in lots of different ways. Um, I think uh, we we are we are part of the environment within which they um, have done very well, and so we can't really um, we can't assume that we have taken the active uh, position entirely. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if Paco has anything to add to yeah. that. No, actually, I, I I forgot to admit I don't have any any position because it's not a, a topic I've I've thought of. Um, if only I could mention that 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 um, as an outsider, I insist I don't have any any opinion because I haven't thought about these issues. But um, but uh, to me there is something um, again um, not worrying, but something that I feel uneasy about. And it's the relation in between plants and humans, um, how we um, still, in a sense, um, kind of, of, of uh, think of them as uh, caring or thinking uh, about us in the reciprocal way that we might think we care for them or something like that. Um, if you put it in an evolutionary perspective, um, most likely uh, most plants care way more about pollinators, about fungi below ground, you know, about their doings. And we are so selfish and so obsessed with ourselves that we end up thinking, oh, again, they are putting up this show for us. No, they are not putting us up any show for us. They are doing their business. The psychoactive um, substances in, found in plants probably are nothing to do with us, are they? Really? That, that's that's what I mean. Just the side products of secondary yeah. metabolism of other for other reasons. And yeah. They happen to work on us just in the same way that we've got a lot of the same neurotransmitters as plants do. That's 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 what I mean about uh, on, on the evolutionary scale, right? Well, yeah. that's again, this is not a spoiler because we we get started with the idea of the anesthetics, the role of anesthetics, right, in the book. So the book kicks off with 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 putting a plant to sleep, right, with anesthetics. So no spoilers, but um, but. But yeah, that goes to, to Natalie's comment, to the heart of Natalie's comment. I mean, um, um, you know, the case of how they biosynthesize their own melatonin. Uh, oh, people get surprised that, that, that they doze off at night, you know, or that you can induce jet lag in a plant. Why? Uh, uh, well, were you thinking, you know, all this evolutionary effort was being done for me? Oh, oh this is going to come handy to humans. <laughs> well, if it's got... If it happens to be handy to us, that's a contingent fact. But before that, way before that, it was something that did make sense at the time that adaptation or that trait evolved for the organism for that was tailor-made, right? So if, if melatonin does play a, a role, we know the role melatonin plays, right? You cross the pond, jet lag, all these things. Well, it's got to play a similar role to them because you can actually, you know, shift the photo period to a plant and induce jet lag. Oh, they do, you know, change the concentrations of, of melatonin and we know how that affects whether they are more or less stressed. What's the big deal? Now people will say, well, that's just plant physiology. Again, well, so be it if we were discussing those issues when we speak of our own melatonin and, and, and how we feel with jet lag. But, but in our case, we speak cognitively. In their case, no, it's just physiology. So again, the double standards. Mm. Um, and that, that double standard is, is such a, a good good point too. I, I, I might say that this question about psychedelics, um, psychedelic plants, that, that they're also plants and that there are many plants that kind of have expanded states of consciousness, coffee, for example, in, included, that, that all might, if we're able to study a, a little bit more, have have these um, ways of being that that are yeah, yeah. you could really recognize as intelligent yeah. and psychedelic plants might not be so so different. Sure. So the challenge, uh, 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 Laura, in this case, uh, the challenge to me is for people if they were truly open-minded, say, no, this is not observed or this is not you know outrageous. This is just a working hypothesis. So why don't we all team up to think of the best way to make it operational? to take the question to the to the bench and test it, regardless of the outcome. So maybe we refute the hypothesis. Maybe we confirm it. Maybe we then refute it. But 
we don't lose anything for trying. So it's just a matter of keeping empirical questions open for discussion. But why to, you know, preemptively ban the very discussion itself? That's what I don't get. So moving on to another uh, set of questions from the audience, um, several questions have been around animism and indigenous perspectives on plants. So I'm curious if you could could talk to how indigenous perspectives play into your own work and um, what your thoughts on animism in particular. Do you have any thoughts, Natalie? I, I'm I not know. an expert in this at all. I think I mentioned the word animism as a, as a kind of general way of um, describing um, sort of uh, as, as referring to kind of some aspects of past um, relationships with nature. It certainly wasn't, um, I wasn't actually referring to indigenous cultures at the time, mm. um, but uh, it was it was more that, I suppose in my own work, I um, look a lot at how humans have a relationship with the world, which is, and this is taking quite psychoanalytical perspective, which is, composed of projections onto the world and and their own internal structures are superimposed on the world so i think that is my inherent view on most human structures of thought mm. in science included you can't really escape that effect you know humans we've seen plenty plenty in the um in, in what we've been talking about of human biases and their it being unable to get outside of their own perspectives yeah. um yes no sorry no sorry sorry keep going <laughs> um but uh so in terms of animism, I think the, um, well, I, 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 I mean, I think we have a lot to learn from indigenous cultures from what I know about it. I'm, I am no expert, but from what I, what I know about it, we have a great deal to learn about non-human centered ways of seeing the world, um, mm. which, which exist in, in other cultures, um, and seeing ourselves as part of a connected network rather than the fulcrum on which the whole thing turns. Mm. Um, or at the top of the natural hierarchy. I think the problem we've had in, you know, since in, in the West for, I think, you know, not even since the Enlightenment, well before that, we've operated on a scala natura um, framework. And people still mm. find that hard to get away from. You know, people with a layman understanding of evolution still see us as the pinnacle of evolution. That's, it's a very hard uh, idea mm. to get away from. So I think yeah. that kind of decentering of the human and the, and the, um, sense that we are part of a network is something that many other cultures are much better at, especially indigenous cultures that are more in connection with nature. Hmm. Yeah, so uh, I only want, wanted to add one comment, um, which is a suggestion for readers, okay? Uh, I, um, again, like with the issue of, of, of um, um, plant ethics itself, which I, I'm not an expert and I don't feel I can make any qualified uh, comment, uh, but I do have a suggestion to make to people who are into uh, indigenous studies or, or another fields of research. Um, in the very same way that I uh, ask the skeptics, the scientific skeptics in, in Western traditions to say, hey, take it easy with respect to the way you are, you know, focusing on the plant physiology itself in a reductionist way and open yourself up to the very possibility regardless of the outcome, which is what I was saying before, right? I, I invite people to do the very same thing coming from the other quarter when reading the book. It's, it's an exercise, that intellectual exercise that only takes, then you can keep on with your life. But it's an exercise that you only need to do it as you are reading the book. An intellectual exercise, which has to do, regardless of the type of preconceptions I may have, one way or another, reductionist or animist or whatever. Uh, I'm gonna try to push to put those aside because when you are reading something, this is not something about the book, the book in itself. It's something that has to do with, you know, I might walk into the theater and watch a film or go to a concert or whatever, but just to, to try to go there uh, empty-handed, uh, to be able to see things that you might miss otherwise by wearing your usual glasses. Then you might do the other thing as well. Then you might say, hey, now I want to see what message I can pick or what how this bears upon 
my tradition, my culture, the way I, I understand my relation with the rest of organisms and, uh, and the rest of the planet, then that's something that you can also do in parallel. But my suggestion is if we uh, try to do this exercise, then we will enrich our perspective both ways has to do with, with my own preconceptions, regardless of whether they are correct or not, and what I will be able to see that I will be missing otherwise by reading this with a, you know, with a light already decided what sort of light, if you see what I mean. Um, hmm. This is a little bit like what we were mentioning before in before the conversation about, you know, when I was telling you about I'm uh, reading now the translation of Planta Sapiens in Spanish for the correcting the Spanish translation. And I was saying, oh, I feel myself like a, the reader. I forgot I was the author and now I'm reading it like from, you know, from the distance. So let's take some distance and let's see what we pick, provided that that distance is, is you know, something that you can then again uh, See what I mean? Thank you. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. And um, someone has asked, how has your research changed your daily lives on a personal level? Our daily lives? Oh, mm. oh my God. Uh, that's a great <laughs> question. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I, well, I, of course, there is an easy answer, right? Which is, and, and you know, if I don't know if there are some of the researchers in the lab here in, in, in the room today or not, but they know Paco is hectically up and down. So one thing has changed in my life is that even though I keep saying we've got to slow down, we've got to watch plant life at plant pace, the truth is that I'm hectically... Boom, boom, you boom, become boom, a hummingbird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so in terms of work, bad news, okay? A lot of work. Now, in terms of attitude, no, in terms of attitude, this is interesting because I keep surprising myself, you know, when I, at the, we were, remember we were talking about, about the work in progress, being work in progress, right? And now, now I'll go to the orchard and water, you know, uh, get the, the orange trees and the olive, whatever, to do something in the orchard. Um, I'm looking at the orange trees and I have the feeling that I understand them less than I used to do. So in a sense, this means, this is good news. This is good news. So to me, the worst news we can have in science is when you can say, okay, I can sit back. I got the answers. No, the other way around. There is no way you can sit back and relax because this is more and more and more and more questions all the time. So now when I'm, if I, if I used to look at my plants, you know, the wild vines in the orchard that I mentioned in the book and everything, and, and those that we were time lapsing, like doing their things without, you know, providing poles or anything, see what they did. And, and I used to, you know, get excited about, oh, I'm gonna, you know, when you went to there and watch the footage, oh, let's see what they've done, right? They're like pirouetting around the, the, the orange trees or whatever. Now, now I kind of have uh, some uh, feeling of not, you know, being uneasy about it when I think, for example, of registering electrophysiological activity. So now I'm, I see the tree there, sitting there, and I try to visualize what's going on inside in the plant body itself, like, you know, the transport, you know, we speak of the transport of, of substances and things, physiology, but the convey of messages, the flow of information throughout the vascular system of the tree. Mm -hmm. And when I'm looking at the tree, I think, oh, I have the feeling that I keep missing it. I keep missing it. So if there is a way that the research has changed me is that I have more questions than when I studied, when I started, right? Thank you. Thank you. And that I don't think that's bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful. I think for me, it's encouraged me to try not to be too comfortable in any particular paradigm of thinking, to try and always be aware of my assumptions, to always be um, aware of other possibilities outside of my comfort zone um, and to be much more flexible in my thinking. Um, I think one of one thing that Paco um, aspires to is, is what he calls maverick thinking, um, which I think is is an admirable um, approach to to exploring the world um, and is most likely to throw up interesting things um, because I, I, I had a very traditional scientific um, education and this completely upends that um, and it I think it's, it's definitely 
and along with the with my other areas of study, sort of history, history and philosophy of science, it helps helps me to just develop breadth and flexibility in my thinking. I think, um, and yeah, I have also I do also do um, look at my plants in a slightly different way. Down <laughs> as well, of course. <laughs> some you. headaches, That's right? Yeah. So we have some some extra headaches on top of the ones we used to have. I feel very guilty about. <laughs> <laughs> thank you both you've certainly left us with a sense of open curiosity and i hope the book uh, opens many curiosities for everyone who reads it and we are at our time so i'm going to say thank you and hand this right over to paul for some final words yeah. yes so thank you laura thank you this will just take a moment and just wanted to thank everyone for participating today thanks so much to paco and natalie and giovanni and laura and everyone and uh if anyone we are going to be posting this online, uh, the recording, so it'll be on the, the uh, YouTube site for the Plant Initiative. And if anyone did not print out the chat and is interested that attended today, feel free to send me an email message at info at plantinitiative.org, and I can send you a copy of the chat. So thank you so much for everyone for participating, and we hope to see you again at a Plant Initiative event. And if you'd like to support the Plant Initiative, we're always happy to accept support. So thank you so much, everyone, for participating today. Bye now. Well, thank you, Paul, and everyone. Bye. Thank you so much. That was great.